God bless you today. Give the Lord a hand, praise. If you're glad, you're blessed. Amen. Amen. Turn with us in your Bibles or turn your attention to the screen, uh, whichever one. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, uh, verse uh, 21 is where we're going to spend our time today. And certainly uh, many of you that are uh, have been a part of the congregational uh, series so far since the first of the year know that this year's theme is ignition or igniting. We are attempting to ignite uh, the growth of, of our gifts and our our formation, our learning, uh, all the many ways that God, uh, through God's spirit, ignites us uh, into um, uh, really activating all the many, many kind of talents that may be latent within. And uh, certainly as we continue these themes today uh, in our preaching, we're going to continue to stay in this particular uh, chapter uh, where I started um, last week preaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to go down to the bottom part, the last few verses of this chapter. And I felt particularly compelled uh, to continue to imagine how we can create communities and extend and expand our capacity uh, to be community together in spite of all the differences, in spite of all of the, the, the ways we are seeing and experiencing the fallen nature of humanity in both our individual relationships and in our systems. <clears throat> I am compelled by this passage of scripture and I hope you will compel be compelled by it as well. It has and continues to be uh, some wonderful language that I love for us to read together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, the word of scripture says, So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours. If I say all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. And so if you weren't here in the weeks previous, you may uh, be trying to figure out who is Paul and who's Apollos and who's Cephas. And so uh, Paul, Apollos, or Cephas are three of many uh, folks that were helping to introduce people to the gospel of Jesus, to the ways of Jesus. And just like humans do, folks get over-identified with the people or the traditions that introduce them to God and start building little camps around them, you know, like I'm a good uh, Pentecostal, or I'm a good Methodist, or I'm a good Presbyterian, or I'm a good Baptist, or I'm a good Catholic, right? Any, any of those good, whatever you are is in here today, amen? And, and, and we forget that no matter what tradition has introduced you to the love of Jesus, amen, they all are working in service of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. That there is no salvation in Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Methodist or Baptist or Catholic. But they all are in service of this great Savior. And uh, the chapter and verses previous uh, are kind of attesting to that because folks were set tripping. You know how we do. Amen. You know, we start falling into our lady. So whether you're Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Baptist or Methodist or Episcopal, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all belong to you. And you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. I love this language. Just come on, repeat that after me. Say, all belong to you. And you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Let us say thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Amen. So we're going to spend this time preaching from the topic, igniting belonging. Uh, igniting belonging. Bow your heads with me as we pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that is always a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May it illuminate. May it Help us to appreciate all the many ways that you are attempting to keep us in the center of your will. I pray, God, that you will bless me as I preach and teach your word. I pray that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. 
Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, let's ignite belonging. Let's ignite belonging. <clears throat> I love uh, this particular passage uh, um, written by Ralph Ellison. Uh, he is a very prominent, famous author, black author, uh, uh, wrote the book called Invisible Man. And, uh, you know, his book was so impactful that I don't think he wrote another book after that. Amen. It's just kind of like he came out with uh, a historically, like, you know, genre changing book. And he's like, okay, I think I'm done writing. Um, maybe he did write something else, but, uh, you know, his book was pretty impactful. And uh, I, I, I want to ground this sermon uh, in some of his words, particularly. Uh, as we are all preparing ourselves to take the Lord's Supper, take communion, take the Eucharist celebration, uh, I find these words to be uh, a very important part of how uh, I hope we enter into this practice. Uh, the words of Ralph Ellison says, I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus shadows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. And when they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, they see everything and anything except me. And uh, I find these words of uh, Ralph Ellison to always re-enter my vocabulary and my efforts to talk about the importance of how we are seen in a society that has become an expert at erasing our humanity. Um, many of you, of course, can appreciate that the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us, uh, whose blood was shed for us, predisposes all of us, hopefully, to a sensitivity around the role of broken bodies and certainly the way in which broken bodies can be redeemed. And yet, we must guard ourselves from losing the kind of sensitivity that helps us be always attuned to the many kinds of ways broken bodies and spirits and minds, and dare I even say souls, are constantly happening all around us. Some of us are aware of those broken bodies, minds, hearts, and souls, and some of us ignore certain broken bodies, minds, or souls, or some of us just can't handle it. And so, you know, there's a thing called active denial. Anybody ever worked in active denial? And passive denial is when you, you, you know, you, you just know certain things are out there, you're not actively trying to, to ignore it, you just, you just, you know, can only take so much. Active denial is when you see stuff and then you try to unsee it. <coughs> you never been around folk like that, right? You know, they're just in active denial. Don't want to acknowledge or see anything. I think uh, we talked about that in my th our therapist appointment <laughs> this week about me. Somebody prayed my strength <laughs> in the Lord. But, but, you know, part of what has and continues to happen, certainly over the last several years, uh, we have rightly been uh, speaking to the brokenness that has been actively rising to the surface of dark-skinned bodies, um, and yet we know that there continues to be uh, the broken bodies of many people we know and love. Uh, I can't help but continue to sit with the broken body of our dear brother Jesse Smollett, who was victimized by the hate and viciousness of some Make America Great Again folk who uh, as they victimized him, 
uh, uh, yelled out homophobic and racist epithets towards him and then tied a rope around his neck and left him uh, in the midst of this terror to have to deal with it himself. And, you know, it was a gift to all of us for him to say it happened because it opens a doorway for us to enter into that pain, appreciating hopefully that his pain is a small representation of many other people's pain, particularly in the queer community. Uh, folks are certainly, you know, if you follow the political conversations, we know that, uh, you know, you have politicians like the governor of Virginia who was found to be dressing in blackface uh, or uh, the Ku Klux Klan outfit, and he's the governor of a state, uh, but at the age of 25, coming out of medical school, where he's on his way to practice medicine on a bunch of folk uh, who uh, got dark skin, he is celebrating, I guess, his graduation by engaging in these kind of practices, and the, again, demonstration of that uh, creates terror in all of us, triggers us, right? Because we have to realize that you got people in high places that don't seem to fully appreciate what these images do to our psyche. We have the genocides that were perpetrated on First Nation and indigenous folk, and many of us were able to hang out I wasn't there, I was sick, but I, 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 I know many folks from the way went on Wednesday and heard Mark Charles and, and uh, Sonia and a bunch of different folks uh, talk about the continued uh, uh, marginalization and erasure of native folks from the land. And, and even as we as good meaning folk, we are participating in that just by squatting and living on this land that we have to sit with that. And, and, and I can just go on and on and on, right? All the many ways we see broken bodies and souls and minds, the criminal justice system, the immigration system that preys on our families and, and separates our families, mothers from children and husbands from wives and partners and loved ones, folks in cages on the border, folks in cages in New York for a whole week without any heat. Man, 10 degree weather in New York federal prison and there's no heat or electricity. And the prisoners are banging on their windows so loudly that crowds of people walking by hear them and that's the only way we find out. That they're in their cells freezing to death. Lives interrupted by gun violence, cancer, loved one was We'll transition this week due to cancer and poverty and greed and all of this violence that we see waged against our bodies and our souls, we are often uh, wrestling with the reality of how this makes us invisible to one another. At least in a practical sense, when people's bodies are taken from us, we can easily forget they were ever there. And yet I continue to wrestle with this truth that part of what we do when we participate in the Eucharist celebration is we are reminded not only that death does not have the final say, because even in the broken body and the blood of Jesus, we continue to to, 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 to receive redemption, but we also must be reminded that the broken bodies around us, when we are not attuned to them, we become complicit in that kind of brokenness, and what's even worse, I would argue, is that it threatens to rob us of our own humanity. The idea that we can be in a society and a culture so violent and not lose our own ability to connect with the harm of that violence. 
I argue, erases our ability to be fully human ourselves. There's so much at stake then when we come to the words of scripture, when we come to the practice of our faith, because when you and I are not able to interrogate the practices both in the world and in our own faith that make us unable to feel the pain of the erasure of certain broken bodies. I argue that our faithfulness to the gospel can easily be called into question. I mean, I want you to just think and sit for this for a moment because uh, you know, it is clear to me that God has no pleasure in the death of anyone. And yet, isn't it interesting that particularly after uh, the uh, 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 violent uh, abuse and, and tragedy of, of Jesse's uh, assault, I, I, I found many of us speaking out saying that this homophobic and racist action against our brother is evil and should be condemned. And depending on who you were, you were more than comfortable to condemn the racist nature of the attack, but felt a little uncomfortable condemning the homophobic nature of it. Or depending on who you were, you were ready to denounce the homophobic nature of it, but you weren't wanting to denounce the racial nature of it. And it began to cause me to think particularly about what is it about how we are existing in the world and in the church where our theological convictions can mute our responses to the violence waged against our soul, our mind, and our body. I mean, it, it became even more pronounced when some of my comrades, you know, who saw some of my denunciations uh, you know, began to come seek me out like Nicodemus in the night, praise God, and, and just, you know, hey, doc, uh, you, know, what, you, know, you know, what does this mean? And, 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 and I began to, to just think about, you know, uh, perhaps we have to start to ask ourselves some questions about what does our theological convictions do to us if they keep us from saying harm to people is wrong because we may not have theological uh, alignment around people's choices or being. And, and, and you know, I, I, I put this out that, you know, if our theological convictions around human sexuality make us have a pause of calling out the violence related to our LGBTQ loved ones, then we have to reconsider or at least interrogate our theological convictions. And I want to argue that, you know, there's a lot at stake for us if we are being formed after the ways of Jesus and we can't call out the suffering of the people Jesus loved. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a hard truth for all of us living in America because we all have our favorites. And so if you're someone who loves health, wealth, and prosperity teaching and you are slow to talk about advocacy or the evil of how systems make folk poor, there's something wrong with our theological convictions related to health and wealth theology. Hello, somebody. If you are someone who is so patriotic that your convictions keep you from being able to declare that the killing of people through war is wrong because you believe in military might. There's something wrong with our theological convictions. If you and I 
don't have the theological or biblical language or interpretation to acknowledge the dignity and humanity of queer loved ones, and it keeps us from being able to boldly pronounce that them being assaulted in the public is wrong, then it means that we have to interrogate our theological convictions. Because if we don't, we are literally allowing a big eraser to take parts of our humanity away without us even knowing it until we have no capacity for compassion for anyone except ourselves. I was deeply compelled by some friends of mine who are queer and got a chance to check in with folks and after this attack and, 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 and I turned into another comrade who wrote this book uh, called No Ashes in the Fire, his name's Darnell Moore, and uh, he, a book review that uh, was written in the New York Times, I, I, I recalled it, I dug it up uh, because I remember posting it sometime, and, and I thought it captured very powerfully the dilemma that many of our loved ones who are queer are dealing with in the immediate aftermath of these kind of attacks. Uh, uh, the, 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 the words say that um, it is a harsh environment, yet the most pervasive violence is not physical. It's the violence of erasure. In this book, Mr. Moore is trying to be seen for his academic talents in a world that expects little more than anger from black boys as a boy trying to understand his sexuality in a world that sees black men as symbols of hyper-heterosexuality, Moore is constantly forced to choose between, listen, safety and identity, often with dangerous consequences either way. The amount of mental energy it takes to constantly reevaluate how much of yourself you can expose is so crushing. Think about what is at stake for us and those whom we love, who are constantly caught between their ability to be without the external pressure of feeling safe or unsafe. I want to suggest to you that as we, followers of Jesus in this moment in time, are leaning into our most faithful expression of Jesus' work in life, we must be calling ourselves to creating spaces, communities, and dare I say, being champions of those who find themselves experiencing the hierarchy, the hierarchy of human value and meaning that is often manifested through all the many ways that we know about racism and misogyny and homophobia and class and gender and nation affiliation. That you and I, if we, it is true that the whole earth belongs to God and everything that lives within it, how many of you know there is then no hierarchy of value in God's eyes. Everything means the same to the God of all creation. And if God loves all of it enough to give God's self on behalf of all of creation, how can we say we follow and love this God if we cannot love all of God's creation? How can we say we love this God if we cannot create a reality where everything that God has created, while it is even in, in a journey to right relationship with God, should be protected and safe? And could it be that part of our theological convictions left uninterrogated keep us in a place of paralysis thus making us all less human, particularly the way God created us to be. 
I was reading one of my friends, Christina Cleveland. She's preached here. Y'all know Dr. Christina Cleveland was here in town. And, and uh, you know, we were talking about her trips about our black Madonna. And, and I just love Dr. Christina Cleveland because she was taking these trips. And she was telling me how folks are just, like, upset with her and, you know, hating on her and all kind of stuff. And I just saying to myself, Lord, have mercy. You start, like, rubbing up against some folks' theological, like, you know, stuff. And, man, I mean, you, you turn violent. And it makes me think, like, what is so at stake for folk in this country where violence becomes the natural response when we disagree? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. I mean, can you imagine how violent you would be with yourself every time you disagreed with yourself? Now, some of you probably are. That's part of the problem. You know. I mean, you know, there'd be some days where I'd just be like, man, bride, I don't know what you're doing with yourself today. But I give myself some grace. Somebody say amen. Give, give your neighbor a high five and tell them, give yourself some grace. Amen. You're not going to agree with yourself all of the time. <laughs> Could it be that part of our task is to learn how to disagree nonviolently without diminishing each other's humanity? Because truth be told, folk have not agreed about much since folk showed up on the earth. But God has still been God. God still looked at the earth and said it was good. And then when it stopped being good, God said, I'm going to come down and make it good again. I want to argue, child of God, that our work as the body of Christ is to always be creating spaces where we are committed to belonging. Where we can sit next to one another, even if we can't fully agree, but we can always acknowledge that you are valued and you are a part of God's creation without condition or exception. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, you know, a couple of the, the, the points that I want to uh, pull out of this, this, this text uh, is, 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 is for me a wonderful uh, uh, hymn or, or set of language that's uniquely found in the uh, New Revised Standard Version of the text that we read. Uh, and so uh, I think we, I had you say it already. I can't remember because it's my second time preaching, but I'm happy to say it again just, just in case I didn't. Repeat after me. Say, all belong to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. We're going to start at the Christ belongs to God and work our way backwards because I do believe that part of what you and I are called to do and be as followers of Jesus is to always start with God. Amen. Because if you can start with God, Rightly, you'll end up in the right place in relation to creation. If you love God rightly, you will rightly love creation. If you and I are being formed rightly after the ways of God, then we will be in right relationship to everything that God created. Why? Because the act of God's uh, uh, the the act of God toward us has always been an act of radical love. Hello, somebody. God created us for God's own pleasure. God's love is what sparked creation. God's love is what sparked salvation and redemption. God's love is what allows us to be alive today. How many know God's condemnation is not why you are here? <laughs> Scripture says, for God so love the world and God did not come to condemn the world but that through this love we all would be saved the first thing then that I, I love for us to point out is that belonging is modeled by God everybody say that belonging is modeled by God verse 23 and Christ belongs to God this is indeed a radically declarative statement that I believe Paul is attempting to set as a foundation for how people appreciate who God is. Now, 
You got to remember, you know, that that when Jesus was on the planet and Jesus was walking around, I remember I was over in Palestine and, and, and got a chance to, you know, walk a couple of places where Jesus walked and there was a big old tree there. And the guy said, this tree has been here for about 5,000 years. And I just brushed up against that tree. I said, Jesus probably just leaned on this tree. I just, I just would, I just would love, I just would love to be able to just, just, just lean where Jesus was. Maybe a little, I don't know, anointing, get on my clothes or something. Amen. That, that, that when Jesus was on the planet, Jesus was declaring things like, I and my father are one. I am in my father and he is in me. Theologically, the the ways in which the early church were understanding the notion of God, when they said God, they meant Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They were talking about a triune God, a God that is all in one, even though they saw or understood within the life of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This, This word that described this kind of interaction was called perichoresis. Y'all hang in here with me for a second, because perichoresis is the Greek term that was used to define the co-indwelling, the co-inhering, and the mutual interpenetration of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within the life of the Godhead. I want you to know, child of God, that there is a certain individuality of the persons within the Godhead that require a intersecting and willing sharing of lives. And I want to suggest that we who are following the ways of Jesus are being called into a sharing of one another's lives that never have us separate from one another. How many of you know that this world is actively trying to keep us apart? Hello, somebody. It majors, it has perfected the art of us being separated. And yet, when you follow the ways of Jesus, I want to argue and suggest that we are called and forced to live our lives in deep relationship and intimacy with one another. Could it be that the key to us creating communities of belonging is that we must model our lives after the inner life of God? So one first quick question that that I want to leave for you today is how can our lives better reflect the perichoresis described within the life of the Trinity, the life of the Godhead? How can our lives be so bound up with God that they cannot be separated from one another? How can our lives be so connected to God that when God's heart breaks for the hurt among us, our heart can do nothing but break? That when God's call for healing or advocacy among those among us goes out that we cannot help but fall in line. I believe too often we are not modeling this deep relational intertwining of our lives, and that's why it's so easy for us to be silent or uninterested in the pain of certain folk while God's heart is breaking and inviting us to stand together. Can your life be so bound up with God's care for your neighbor, and even those you don't like? Mm. I need God's help. Clap <laughs> someone just say, I need God's help, amen. Because there, there's some folk right now I can think of that it's gonna take the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Somebody say amen. It's going to take, take the Hail Marys. It's going to take the, the speaking in tongue, the swinging from the chandeliers. For me to, like, be, 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 
be interested in your pain because I've been shaped or formed to not care. But that is what following Jesus will do. Jesus don't let nobody off the hook. Second thing that the scripture lifts up that should be a, 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 a driver of how we uh, create communities of belonging is we must remember that we belong to Christ first. Everybody say that first. first. Now, uh, the, the text, it, it says that you belong to Christ. Now, be mindful, child of God, that you can be a follower of Jesus and still not yet belong to Christ. Because how many of you have ever, you know, uh, kept some parts back? Like, God, I'll give you my toe, but, you know, I got to keep my, my, my hand now. <laughs> you want to take all of it. Man, God, you're so selfish. Like, can I, can I keep some of this for myself? Anybody ever been like that? God, you, you, all, you want everything? You, I mean, you, you, you really, like, trying to be all over my business like that? I give you Sunday, God, about two hours. Don't let the preachers preach too long. No. <laughs> that for many of us, belonging to Christ is not yet a full reality. For many of us, we, we you know, it's like we, we, we got a layaway plan, you know. God, I'll give you a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, a little bit next week. How many of you know that you belong to Christ means that it is Christ's responsibility to take good care of every part of your life? That there's so much at stake when you don't let God have God's way. I mean, we, we, you seen the song, soon as I stop worrying. Worrying how the story is. When I let go and I let God, let God have his way. What did the next part say? That's when things start happening. When I stop looking at back then. When I let go and I let God, let God have his way. You belong to God. Do you understand how great your life could be? If you lived in such a way where you really declared, I belong to Christ. Yes. Yes. That it's Christ's responsibility to make sure all this works out. That I'm just waking up, showing up every day, waiting on God to work it out. Uh -huh. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to be faithful. God gave, give me a little something, something, and I'm going to be a good steward over that. But God, when the thing gets out of my control, it's up to you. To fix it. Fix it, Jesus. Y'all hear him say, fix it, Jesus. Take the wheel. It's more than a slogan. What does it mean for you and I to ensure that we belong to Christ, that Christ fully owns us? And I can look back in parts of my life and acknowledge, you know, there are times and seasons in my life where other people have more influence over my life than God. And I can just use real menial examples, right? You know, you can look at fashion, and you can tell folks, some folks got more control over you than you do. Because they put on some ridiculous outfits, have some ridiculous hairstyles, and lo and behold, you, next day you got a new makeover. I remember when I was a teenager, I had a high top Gumby fade, and, and, and you, know, it, you know, I thought I was fly. You know, I had crisscross colors, and, you know, one side was, I think, orange, and the other side was green, and, and the back was striped with polka dots, looking like a cartoon character, praise God. But somebody had it on a music video, and I wanted to, you know, fit in, so I put on colors that should not have been together. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that you can look back on some pictures and you'll be trying to figure out, why was my hair like that? What kind of glasses was those, amen? Like them glasses, I had to move them like that. They, the frames was just so big and, and, and why was my hair, what, what, what was that all about? Somebody has some influence over you. I'm not hating on, I'm just asking you the question. 
what would your life be like if Jesus had that much influence? Well, all you had to read was some of the words of Jesus and you would change your whole appearance. Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor in spirit and your whole appearance will change. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Love your enemies. Pray for them that use you. Can you imagine Jesus had that kind of control over you? You be in the mirror every day getting a makeover? Your attitude, your disposition, your soul, your mind, and your spirit. So, does all of you belong to Christ yet? That's the question. And yet is an invitation. It's not a condemnation. Because as long as you are alive, you have some yet left to go. I know some of us have been speaking in tongues since we came out of our mother's womb. Some of us, we've raised a few folk from the dead. We've walked on the water a few times. But how many know you still got some yet? You still have some ways where you must reckon, God, what parts of me don't belong to you yet? And how can I ensure that you have the ownership, the deed to my heart, my plans, my soul? Final thing I'll say is we must expand who belongs to us. If it's true that God wants to ignite within us gifts, growth, gifts and growth, God wants to ignite. How many of you know perhaps we don't have room for this ignition? So God needs to expand our boundaries. Still keeping you and I, because as human beings, we all have capacities. We're not going to be boundless people. But we are people with intentionality can widen our circles of concern. We must have concern for people who are different than us if we're going to be followers of Jesus. If you're not going to follow Jesus, then you really can't pick and choose who you're going to like. You really can't. And so God bless you. That's an easier way to live than to follow Jesus I'm talking about now. But this Jesus we follow in don't let you pick and choose. This Jesus, this Jesus ain't playing no games. This Jesus not, not letting you, you know, just, uh, I'm not, not going to rock with them. This Jesus is saying to us that all belongs to you. Now, belonging does in this in this context is not about ownership as an expression of colonizing. Amen. You know, we, we're not out here to be colonizers. That's not what God means. Now, in America, that's what it means. So that's why folk are just always trying to control everybody's bodies. Because that's what it means to, I mean, you know, I get the control. I get to determine where you move, how you move, when you move, if you move. And if you move too fast, then I'm going to kill your body. That's not what we call to do or be. Because God is the God of all creation. (laughs) But God does call us in the first uh, early texts of the scriptures to be stewards of the earth. Dominion is not colonizing, it is stewardship. To take responsibility for everything. Somebody say everything. Everything. Now again, everything is a relative, has a relative reach. Again, our humanity doesn't allow us to be able to control everything, but you, what you have in your hands, what is within your influence, If we are faithful to this call that this belongs to me in the sense of stewardship, then can you imagine how the two or three hundred members of the way 
who live this way, sprinkled across the Bay Area, how much impact we could have if we truly saw everything as an extension of our stewardship to God's creation. That when the undocumented person is hurting, they belong to me. When the queer loved ones are hurting, they belong to me. When the formerly incarcerated folks or the folks trapped in systemic poverty or even some of these politicians who are always confused about what to do. All of that belongs to me. And because it belongs to me and we belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God, we have the responsibility to care for it all. God's not asking us to change it all, but God's asking us to care for it, to attend to it, to not ignore it. And this child of God is how we create communities of belonging. As we go through this year, I hope you appreciate that people around us are looking for these kinds of communities. They may not come to the way, but wherever you are, you are the church. The church ain't the way Christian Center at 1305 University. You are the church. Wherever you are, you have the capacity to exude God's love and care for the world. Now some of us, you know, our capacity can be limited. You know, we ain't been used to doing it this way. You know, because our theologies were kind of painted us a bit in the box. But it's okay, because you're connected to God. <laughs> ain't that something? How you know God ain't in no box now? So if you connect to God, you know, you in a box because you want to be in a box. Well, you you kind of start, you know, following. God will lead you out of a box or two. Maybe put you in a bigger box because, you know, <laughs> you know, some of us can't take too much freedom at one time. <laughs> and how many know that's true? Amen. Yeah, some of us, you know, I want freedom. You don't want no freedom. <laughs> it's clear. You don't want it. So I'll give you a little bit more. <clears throat> but just know, child of God, that this is a big part of who we have to become. We have to become people who are willing to create communities where folks belong. And I guarantee you that, you know, if God loves them, they, 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 they'll fit right in right alongside you pretty good if you can tap into the love that God has for them. Which, by the way, is the same love God has for you. And for us, let's stand to our feet, everyone, and prepare ourselves for prayer. God, in the name of Jesus, I am praying for the person who I'm touching today. I pray, God, that your love will be felt by them as I touch them. May they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they belong to you, that they belong to me. And we all belong to God. I want to say specifically, God, a prayer on behalf of all of our LGBT loved ones that are here today or in our families or in our communities who are dealing with the vulnerability that these most recent attacks have brought to the front of their mind. Pray for the young people and the teenagers, Lord God, who may be struggling, God, with, Lord, their sexuality and trying to make sense of it. May they know that they are loved. May they know that they are created in your image. May they know, God, that even here in this house of worship, God, that they are affirmed by you and certainly by us. God, I represent and stand in the gap on behalf of so many 
who somehow have not believed that you love them. So God, I pray that if the person I'm touching right now feels that way, just squeeze gently their hand, everybody. I squeeze into their hand love. I squeeze into their hand, Lord God, compassion and healing and community. I pray, God, that they will know, God, that they belong here, right where you've placed them. So, God, bless us as a church, bless us as a people, as a country, even all of creation. Tear down the walls of enmity, the walls of division, the walls of violence that war against us and put us into right relationship one with another. Lift up your hands where you're standing. It's me, O oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need your love, Lord, to be poured out upon me. I need your wisdom and your knowledge, your revelation to be unleashed upon me, God. Lord, some of us have these theological convictions and we've been taught the faith and trained in the faith in ways that limit our capacity to love or to stand in solidarity with, Lord God, those who are suffering and marginalized, or those who are poor, or incarcerated, those who are queer, those who are, are rich, or those who, who are victims of violence or perpetrators of violence. And God, we have all these kinds of convictions that make us have even a little bit of pause to extend to them the full opportunity to be in relationship with you and with me and so God I pray that you will help us God set us free from that which Lord keeps us from being fully human with each other through the power of your spirit I pray God that this would be the reality of how our church operates in 2019 and even beyond heal the pain and loose the chains and we'll say thank you God We'll say thank you, God. Restore our families. I feel the Spirit just prompting this on my heart. Some of us have family relationships that are estranged. But I hear God saying, I'm, I'm ready to heal some family relationships. I'm ready to mend some fractures. Some of you have your own internal struggles happening. I hear God saying, I'm ready to bring peace in the middle of some storms. Some of you are angry at God because of all of the things that are going on around you. I hear God saying that you can cast your care and your burdens on him because God cares for you. As you lift your hands, I just dare you give whatever it is to God right now. Just unload it off your shoulders and give yourself to God. 